We're going to continue in our study of 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to be finishing off chapter 4 this morning. And I've titled today's message, Caught Up Together. Caught Up Together. And we'll be in verses 13 through 18 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So as you're turning there, let me um, share uh, a few things. Back in chapter 3, verse 6, we learned that Timothy had returned to Paul and reported that the church at Thessalonica was thriving. This news, the church was doing well. It it gave Paul a, a deep sense of joy, which led him to give thanks to God. And then we see that he prayed for a reunion with them and for also just an increase of love and an overflow of love, continued love for one another, which reminds me, you know, I, this past week, many of you have demonstrated here that love. I've heard about it. I've seen it. Um, man, it just brings me also a lot of joy when, when I see brothers and sisters stepping up and helping one another out, and praying for one another, and, you know, it, it's just, it does. I maybe have a little bit of an idea what Paul was, was feeling here. But we see, again, him praying for them. And then from there, Paul encouraged the Thessalonian Christians to live their lives in ways that were pleasing to God through sexual purity and holy living. Now, it appears that in Timothy's report, the church there had a few questions of their own for Paul. The first one, which we covered the last time I was up here, last time we were together, had to do with brotherly or phileo love among the community of believers and how that love will be a testimony to those outside of the church. Well, in this section we're about to read and cover, Paul appears to be answering a second question that they had. What will happen to the dead in Christ? And Maybe this is a question that you've struggled with or that you may want to know more about. We'll hear again in these verses Paul will answer that question. Now, this reply will consist of a statement of the topic, a theological affirmation, also information, and and, and also application. Now, as we go through this last section of chapter 4, many of you will recognize it, will be familiar with it. Maybe you've heard it read or, or spoken at funerals, but it also, maybe you've found it familiar or you, you recognize it because of two important doctrinal themes, Christian doctrinal themes. The death of a believer, which I'll cover first, and two, the rapture of living believers, which I'll cover in the second part of our reading. If you're a believer here this morning, our passage today isn't intended to instill in you a sense of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Not at all. Rather, the words of Paul here are meant to give you, as a believer, as a born-again Christian, a comforting hope that one day, one day soon, all true believers, living and dead, will be reunited in heaven, will be united in heaven with Christ. See, church, because we have a Savior who has conquered death, we don't have to fear 
death, or the future. See, so, so what these verses, verses 13 through 18, will do is it's going to shed further light on what Jesus said in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. There he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And so before we get into our first part of our passage, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak powerfully to us this morning. Heavenly Father, there is a reason and purpose you have us all here. So now as you sit at your feet and hear your word and hear this message that you helped me to prepare, I pray that you will make it known. It will be clear that these words, again, will just be implanted deep into the hearts and minds of those that are here and those that are watching, Lord. I pray that these words also will bring comfort and hope to those who may be suffering, may be going through a hard time, or maybe at the last parts of their life, Lord, and they're looking for comfort. But I pray that you will be with them, that you will minister to them, Lord, and show them by trusting in you. There's, there's glory. There's beauty that awaits them. So now, as again, as Isaac prayed, I pray you fill this room, Lord, with your spirit. I want to hear from you now. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. The Word of God says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again in the same way through Jesus, God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep. And stop there. In the Jewish Talmud, there's a line that says this, Man is born with his hands clenched. He dies with them wide open. Entering life, he desires to grasp everything, leaving the world. All he possessed has slipped away. That was right as this statement is. There are many things, unfortunately, that the Jews still, to this day, misunderstand about death. Even back in the Old Testament days, believers, or Old Testament believers, had an imperfect and incomplete knowledge of what happened to a person after, at the time of, of death. To them, Sheol was an all-purpose word to de- use to describe the dis disembodied state, both of believers and unbelievers. They believed that everyone would die eventually, and that apparently there would be one general resurrection at the end of the world, and then a final judgment. In John chapter 11, verse 24, Martha reflected these sketchy views by saying, I know that he will be and I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But now, today, we know through several passages in our Bibles that the believer departs when the believer departs to be to or he takes his last breath, he departs to be with Christ at that final moment. On the other hand, Luke chapter 16 says that the unbeliever is said to be in Hades. 
Now, here are a few, other thing, few other things we also know from the pages of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. We know that not all believers will die, but that all will be changed. We know that there will be more than one resurrection. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23, and 1 Thessalonians, again, this verse here, verse 16, at the rapture, only believers will be raised. The wicked dead will be raised at the end, at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. Now, when Paul first went to Thessalonica, he taught Christians about Christ's coming to reign uh, Christ coming to reign and that the event, what events that would follow. But in the meantime, problems had arisen regarding uh, believers, regarding these saints, certain saints who had died. Would their bodies remain in the grave until the last day? Would they be excluded from participation in Christ's coming? and in his glorious kingdom. And so to answer their questions and to calm their fears, Paul here describes the order of events at the time of Christ's coming for his people. The formula, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, is used to alert us readers, those reading this letter, and us as well, to an important announcement. Paul also used similar language four other times in his letters here, in, throughout his letters. In Romans chapter 11, verse 25, says, don't be ignorant about God's plan for Israel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, don't be ignorant about spiritual gifts. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, don't be ignorant about the suffering and trials in the Christian life. And then here, in verse 13, concerning those who are asleep, that is, those believers who have died. Now, the reason sleep is used in this way, the reason why Paul uses sleep because it basically describes the physical bodies of departed Christians. He's not referring to spirits, to their spirits or souls. It's been said that sleep is an appropriate smile of death because in death, a person seems to be sleeping. And in a sense, it's also a, a good description also, because every night when you're laying in bed, we act this out as a symbol of death. And every morning when you wake up, even with your stanky breath, it's like the resurrection. It's like being resurrected again. So it's a picture. It's a, it's a simile. Now, again, just to be clear, the Bible doesn't teach the Bible doesn't teach that the soul sleeps when a person dies. In Luke chapter 16, the rich man and Lazarus were both conscious in death. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8 actually tells us that when a believer dies, he is present with the Lord. Also, Philippians chapter 1 says that to die is to be with Christ, a position which Paul speaks of as a gain and as being far better. So this would scarcely be true if the soul were sleeping. Neither does the Bible teach annihilation Annihilation. In other words, the person just ceases to exist upon death. The believer, Jesus says in Mark chapter 10, 
enjoys eternal life. While the unbeliever, Mark 9 and Revelation 14 says, suffers eternal punishment. Now, with regard to those saints, those saints who have died, the apostle says that, tells us there, there is no need to grieve like the rest who have no hope. Now, he doesn't say there that you shouldn't have sorrow. I think all of us have known loved ones that have departed and gone on to be with the Lord. And it's tough. I've lost my mother, and Robin recently lost her mother, and it's tough. It is emotionally hard. We, we do, do feel sorrow because we miss them. Again, he's not saying there that you shouldn't feel sorrow. Jesus, remember, wept at the grave of Lazarus even though he knew that he would raise him up just a few minutes later. So what he's saying here is that we shouldn't have a despairing grief, a despairing grief like those who have no hope of heaven, of reunion. Verse 14 tells us now, the basis of the believer's hope is the resurrection of Christ. Just as surely as we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that those who have fallen asleep in Jesus will be raised and will participate will be a part of His coming. I want you to also notice that this verse is essentially saying that those who through Jesus sleep, knowing that it's merely the lover of our souls giving sleep to the bodies of His beloved ones, ought, it just ought to rob death of its terror. Furthermore, this verse speaks of believers who have died are presently in heaven. Now, some falsely teach that when believers die, they remain in the casket until the rapture. But here's the thing. What did Jesus say to the thief on the cross who was next to him? He didn't say, you will sleep for a couple thousand years, and then you'll be resurrected. (laughs) No, he didn't say that. He said, today, today you will be with me in paradise. So you see, my brothers and sisters, the moment someone leaves his or her body in death, An amazing thing happens. He moves into eternity where there is no time. There's no past, no present, no future. It's all just a great big now. Because eternity, eternity transcends time. How do we know this? Albert Einstein hypothesized about heaven without even knowing it. His theory revealed that if one could ever travel at the speed of light, time would cease. Therefore, because God is light, time ceases in His presence. Thus, from the perspective of those in heaven, the rapture has happened. I ought to blow you away. From their perspective, in heaven, those in heaven, the rapture has happened. And we're already with them in heaven. Now, how can this be? You may be asking. Well, here's a good way to, to think of it. 
Now, follow along. Hopefully you can here. I tried my best to, to, to paint this out. Now, imagine seeing me watching the El Paso Thanksgiving Day Parade there on Montana Avenue. And after seeing me, you come by, you come up to me and say, hey, Angel, it's good to see you. Listen, did you see the turkey float go by already? Yeah, it was great, I say. Oh, I missed it. I really wanted to see it, you say. Well, you can still see it if you go further down Montana, I explain. In other words, if you go to the past, that's already past me. If you go to the past, that's already past me. What's fresh for you will be something I've already seen. Now, if you come to me and ask me what was coming up in the parade, I'd say, I don't know. You'll have to go to the future to where the parade begins. On the other hand, I could say, let's just get to the Toys for Tots float and we'll be able to see the whole parade simultaneously, past, present, and future. This, again, is the best illustration I know to describe the concept of eternity. And it's just very flawed. You see, here's the thing. We're down here on the curb, watching the parade of life, wondering what's coming. From heaven's perspective, like the view from, uh, from the Toys for Tots float, it's all one big now. From heaven's perspective, the rapture has already happened. From our perspective, however, we're still waiting on the curb. I say this because many of us have dealt with the departure of loved ones. And we miss them terribly. And we're yearning to see them again, to be with them again. And with this flawed, again, example, tells us they're with us. In their perspective, they're with us already. This is something that when I found out about it, again, it blew my mind. It, it blows my mind to, to know that from heaven's perspective, Robin's with her mother. I'm with my mother. You're with your departed loved ones. They're rejoicing. You're rejoicing with them. Because again, there in heaven, it's all one big now. Now, personally, I don't believe that heaven could be heaven if a husband left his family behind and wondered how they would survive, or if a mother left their kids behind and worried about their well-being. This is why I suggest to you that heaven can only be heaven if we're all there simultaneously. The fact of our Lord's return is comfort. It's comfort to those who are grieving because we know that He will bring with Him, He will bring with Him His people who have died in the Lord. There was a time, and maybe, you know, this, you can relate to this. I used to tell people, I hear you lost a loved one. I'm very sorry. But that changed. That changed when I once heard someone give this reply. No, I didn't lose them. You can't lose something when you know where it's at, where you, when, you know, when you know where it is. And I know I know where they are. So if you know where your loved one is at, 
and you haven't lost them. On the authority of God's word, we also know what will happen. Jesus Christ will one day return and bring his people with him. When will this event occur? Nobody. Nobody knows. Nobody has a date or a time. And if anyone claims they do, run away from them as fast as possible. Nobody knows, and it is. It's wrong to set dates. The fact that Paul used the pronoun we in verse 15 and 17 suggests that he expected to be alive when the Lord returned. Theologians call this the doctrine of imminent of the imminent return of Christ. Imminent means that it can happen at any moment, at any time. It can happen right now. It can happen five seconds from now. It's imminent. As Christians, as believers, we don't look for signs. Nor, will we, nor must any special events transpire before the Lord can return. These great events will take place in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 52 says. In the twinkling of an eye. As Christians, then, whether we live or die, we have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear because Jesus will come either with us or for us. And so the fact of his return is, our com is a comfort to our hearts. So then... The next passage that I'll be reading to you all, and you'll follow along, Paul explains how he knows all this. So let's pick up in verse 15 and read the rest of chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. For we say this to you, by a word from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. When Paul preached the doctrine of the, res of the resurrection to the uh, Athenian philosophers in Acts chapter 17, most of them, most of them mocked him. You see, because to the Greeks, being rid of the body was their great hope. Why would anyone, why would any man want to have this body resurrected? I know I wouldn't. I wouldn't want this body resurrected. Furthermore, how... Can the body be resurrected when the elements of the body would decay and become part of the earth? And so to them, the doctrine of the resurrection was foolish and just simply impossible. Verse 16 tells us that when Jesus Christ returns in the air, he will issue the shout a shout of a, a command, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, this doesn't mean 
that he will put the elements of the body together again. He just, not, it's not going to be like Plato, you know, especially if, you know, people have been, have died out in sea or have been cremated or one of the other methods. It doesn't mean that he will put all these elements back together again for the resurrection. The resurrection isn't reconstruction. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul there, he made an argument for the resurrection. There he pointed out that the resurrection of the human body is like the growing plant from a seed. The flower isn't the identical seed that the plant that was planted, yet there's continuity from seed to plant. Christians, if you're again a believer here this morning, a born-again Christian, Christians will receive glorified bodies just like the glorified body of Jesus Christ. The dead body is the seed that is planted in the ground. The resurrection body is the flower that comes from that seed. There are also passages like John chapter 5, verse 20 and 29, and Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, that indicate there are two resurrections in the future. When Jesus Christ returns to the air, returns in the air, he will call to himself only those who are saved through faith in him. This is called the first resurrection or the resurrection of life. And then, at the end of time, just before God ushers in the new heaven and the new earth, there will be another resurrection. This is called the second resurrection, or the, the resurrection of judgment. Between these two events, and here at this church, this is what we teach and espouse, I believe that the tribulation on earth and that in between these two events we'll have the tribulation and, uh, on earth and the 1,000 year kingdom in that time that, that it will occur. Now this verse also says that three unique sounds will be involved in this event. The Lord shout the sound of the trumpet, and the voice of an archangel. Jesus Christ will give a shout of command, just as he did, just as he did outside the tomb of Lazarus. John chapter 5, verse 28 says that those in the graves shall hear his voice. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, also relates his return to the sound of a trumpet. Now this here, this sound of, of a trumpet, is something that the Jewish people would have been very familiar with because trumpets were used to declare war, to announce special times and seasons, and then to gather a people together for a journey. Thirdly, why is the voice? Why the voice of an archangel? The only archangel who's named in the Bible is Michael, who apparently has a special ministry to Israel. According to Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, there is more than one archangel. So we can't be certain, we can't be sh sure that this is, in fact, is Michael's voice, where it will be Michael's voice. But at any rate, whoever it is, whoever that archangel is, they will shout in victory. All those angelic, all those angels will be shouting in victory when Jesus Christ comes. Now, I want to reiterate something I said earlier. 
the Christian doctrine of resurrection assures us that death, death is not the end. The grave is not the end. If you fear death, if you fear the grave, my friends, it's not the end. The body again, we're told, goes to sleep, regardless of the method that it goes to sleep. But the soul, the soul goes to be with the Lord. When the Lord returns, he will bring the soul with him, will raise the body in glory, and will unite body and soul into one being to share his glory forever. Let me repeat that. When the Lord returns, he will bring the soul with him, will raise the body in glory and will unite the body and soul into one being to share His glory for all of eternity. So this leads us to another fact that gives us comfort and assurance in the face of death. A term, a theme that many of you are familiar with or have heard about, the rapture. Now, yes, it's true. The word rapture isn't, the English word rapture, isn't used here in verse 17. But that's the literal meaning of the phrase caught up. The Latin word rapto means to seize, to carry off. And from it, we get our English word rapture. One Greek scholar Preached, who preached on this passage, explained the various meanings of the Greek word that is translated caught up in verse 17. Each of these meanings has a special truth, adds a special truth to the doctrine of our Lord's return. To catch away speedily is one. This is the translation in Acts Chapter 8, verse 39, where the Spirit caught away Philip after he led the Ethiopian to Christ. When the Lord returns in the air, we who are alive will be caught away quickly in the twinkling of an eye. So, my friends, this means that we should live each moment in the expectation of our Lord's return lest he come and find us out of his will. Now, another one, to claim for one's own self. This views the rapture from our Lord's point of view as he comes to claim his bride. Another, to move to a new place. Paul used this word when he described his visit to heaven in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Jesus Christ has gone to prepare a place for us, we're told in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. And when he comes, he will take us. He will take all of us to that glorious place. Brothers and sisters, keep this in mind. We're pilgrims here. We're strangers in this world our true citizenship, your true citizenship, is in heaven. And one last one, to rescue us from danger. Taken from Acts chapter 23, verse 10, when the dispute became violent, the commander feared that Paul might be torn apart by them and ordered the troops to go down, take him away from them, take him away from them, and bring him into the barracks. This suggests that the church will be taken home before, before the time of the tribulation that will come to the world from God. Chapters 1, verse 10, and chapter 5, verse 9 in this letter 
seems to state this clearly. Another question that comes up is, will the unsaved world, will they know, will they be aware of what's happening? Will they hear the shout, the voice, and the trumpet? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52 indicates that this will happen, this is going to happen so suddenly, so suddenly, and that it's, it's going to be over in the twinkling of an eye. And so, since the shout, voice, and trumpet apply to God's people, there's no reason to believe that the unsaved masses will hear them. And if they do, they will hear sounds. They just will hear sounds without meaning. Millions, millions of people will vanish instantly. And no doubt, no doubt, there will be chaos and great concern. The last couple of verses also tell us about a beautiful reunion that will take place. You and I shall meet the Lord in the air in person when he comes for us. The Greek word translated meet carries the idea of meeting a royal person or a VIP. Here on earth, we've walked with Christ by faith. But as it says in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, in the air we shall see him as he is and become like him. What a glorious, what a glorious meeting that's going to be. Why? Because we're going to have glorious bodies. When he was here on earth, Jesus prayed that we, that we may one day see his glory and share in it. The suffering that we endure today will be transformed into glory when he returns. It's also going to be an everlasting meeting for we shall forever forever be with the Lord. Consider his promise. This was one of his, Jesus' promises in John chapter 14, verse 3. He said this, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. He wants you to be with him. He's going to come again. If you're in him, he's in you. He's going to take you to himself. You see, the goal of redemption isn't just to rescue us from judgment, but to relate us to Christ. Friends, our meeting from the Lord, our meeting with the Lord will also be a time of reckoning. This is called the judgment seat of Christ. And I talked about this a minute ago. The Greek word bema, bema, which is translated judgment seat, referred to the place where Olympic judges awarded crowns to the winners. Our works. Your works as a believer will be judged. And rewards will be given. Now, the judgment seat of Christ must not be confused with the white throne judgment described in Revelation chapter 20. You may contrast these two important events this way. The judgment seat of Christ, only believers. The white throne judgment, only unbelievers. The judgment seat of Christ, immediately after the rapture, the white throne judgment after the thousand-year kingdom. The judgment seat of Christ determines rewards for service. The white throne judgment determines the amount of judgment. So we'll not only meet the, our Lord 
Jesus Christ in the, in, at the rapture, but we're also going to be reunited with our believing friends and loved ones who have died. Together with them is a great statement of encouragement. See, death. Death is the great separator. But Jesus Christ is the great reconciler. Now, the Bible does it to reveal all the details of this reunion. When Jesus raised the widow's son from the dead, he tenderly delivered him to, her, to his mother. This suggests that our Lord will have the happy ministry of reuniting broken families and friendships. Imagine that moment Christ brings you in and says, here you go. Here's that person that you've missed so much, that you've loved so much. I'm looking forward to that so much. On the Mount of Transfiguration, the three disciples knew and recognized Moses and Elijah. So certainly the saints, believers, will know each other in glory, including believers who have never met. I'm looking forward to meeting all these saints of old. The so-called fathers of Christianity who started churches and there's just so many people I'm looking forward to meeting. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 13, verse 12, For now we see only a reflection, as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, as I am fully known. And when we get to chapter 5, we see how Paul relates this doctrine of the return of Christ to the unsaved. But it would be good for us now to examine our own hearts to see if we're ready to meet the Lord. Are you ready to meet the Lord? One mark of a true Christian is his or her eager Eagerness or looking forward, looking for the coming of Jesus Christ. As we grow in the Lord, we not only look for His appearing, but we love His appearing. We're not scared of Him coming back. We're not worried about it. We're not concerned. We're looking forward to it. We love it. And because we have this hope in Him, we keep our lives pure so that we may not be ashamed at His coming. Don't be that believer that has His hand in the cookie jar when He raptures you. Robert Murray Cheyenne, the godly Presbyterian preacher, used to ask people, do you think Jesus Christ will return today? Most of them would reply, no, not today. Then Mick Cheyenne would say, then my friend, you'd better be ready. For he is coming at such an hour as ye think not. Church, death is a fact of life. You've heard it said before, there are two certain things in life. Death and taxes, for sure, for sure death. The only thing we can escape, the only way we can escape death is to be alive when Jesus Christ returns. Death isn't an accident. It's an appointed time. Hebrews 9.27, and just as it is appointed for people to die once, and after this judgment. So again, I ask the question, 
If you should die today, where would your soul go? Where would your soul go? We know that the bodies will be buried, be planted. Again, regardless of the method, but where will your, will your soul go? I want to start closing by saying this. And, and one of the reasons why we decided to do um, uh, communion next week is I, there was a lot of information here that I didn't want to skip, that I didn't want to shorten. And that's why I reserved it for just these verses for this week. The hope which Paul speaks of in our text is the hope of our gospel. If you're a believer in Jesus, you should be confident of your literal, physical resurrection from the dead because the Lord Jesus has already been literally, physically raised from the dead. Your resurrection is as certain as His. Your resurrection is the fruit of faith in the Lord Jesus, the fruit of the gospel. Thus, when you proclaim the gospel to others, you are offering them the same hope and confidence regarding eternal life and death. I have this firmly in mind whenever I do a funeral service for someone who has died, regardless if they're a believer or not. See, there's no message. There's no message. And, I, and just recently, I had a coworker that passed away, and I was at a funeral home. I was asked to share, uh, give the eulogy or give the message in a room full of World Patrol agents, government workers. I shared the gospel at the end. I shared the gospel because I know how important it is. There is no message other than the gospel of Jesus Christ that gives men and women the assurance of sins forgiven and of spending eternity in the presence of God. To fail to preach the gospel to those who grieve the loss of a friend or loved one is to fail to offer them hope and freedom from the fear of death. I've already asked my wife, and I've talked to Isaac about this already, when I die, I want the best evangelist around to speak and to share the gospel. I want as many people to hear it. I want my death to bring more people to the cross. That's what I desire, and that's what all of you should desire as well. This leads me to the other side of the coin. While Paul doesn't emphasize this truth here, it would be good for me to remind you that death isn't the end, end of it all for those who have rejected Christ's offer of salvation. Just as the dead in Christ will surely be raised to eternal joy in the presence of the Savior, the lost will be raised to eternal torment, away from His presence, eternally separated from God. This is what Paul says in his second epistle to the Thessalonians. Since it is just since it is just for God to repay with affliction those who, will afflict, who have afflicted you and to give relief to you who are afflicted along with us, this will take place at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with powerful angels. When he takes vengeance with flaming fire on those who don't know God and on those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, 
they will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength on that day when he comes to be glorified by his saints and to be marveled at, at by all those who have believed because our testimony among you was believed. My friends, those watching, listening, listen carefully. If you've never acknowledged your sin and your need of salvation through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, on your behalf, I urge you, I urge you today, right now, while it's called today, for the rapture happens, to place your faith and trust in Him at this very moment. And it can happen just like that. And you can be ready. If you're ready, if you understand your need for Jesus, you want your sins forgiven, I invite you to the cross where Jesus can do that. This decision, your decision, whether you want to or not, will have eternal consequences. So if you're ready right now to offer your heart to Jesus, to make him your Lord, your Lord and Savior, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I now believe you died for my sins and confess you rose from the dead. I turn from my sins. I repent from them and I repent of them and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Savior. Thank you for dying me, dying for me. Thank you for giving me. Thank you for saving me. Now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you're watching this and you pray that, Welcome to the family of God. There's now assurance. You now have an assurance. You will spend eternity with the Lord and that you will one day be reunited with all those loved ones, all those people that passed away that you knew were believers. Find comfort and hope in that. Let us know that you prayed that. Reach out to us. We want to help you in your next steps. If you're here locally, we invite you. Come to Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. Hope you have a great day. Be blessed. Be a blessing to others. Goodbye. We love you. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.